myself and Adele will, of course, be presenting today's masterclass, which is a five step guide to implementing sustainability in a startup fashion business. As Cristiano already mentioned, myself and Adele are both full time lecturers at the Academy. And over the last few weeks, we've had a lot of information at the Alpha Talks. We've had a lot of professionals in their field present exciting ideas. But what we get a lot as teachers is a lot of questions of where can we start? Where do we start if we want to begin our own fashion business? What are the steps? And of course, the best step is to start. And hopefully today we can give you a lot of inspiration and a lot of ideas. This is, of course, mine and Adele's favourite topic. We love talking about sustainability in regards to design. So we could do a presentation of five hours, but Cristiano said that's far too long. So throughout the presentation, what we actually have is a few information slides. And these will give you additional resources that you can refer to in your own free time. There's some beautiful websites that you can review, also some great videos that I would highly recommend. Myself and Adele will also notify, notify you when these slides come up, so you can take a picture with your phone or you can screenshot. So I'm going to hand you over to Adele to get started. Just want to double check that my microphone is on because my screen is now full screen, so I can't check anything. It's perfect. Brilliant. All right, so we're going to give you a five step guide of how you can implement sustainability practice into a startup fashion business. Uh, number one is define your company goals, which I'll briefly talk about in a second. Second step is design. Third step is fabric. Fourth step is colour and fifth step is production. And it's quite interesting listening to the um, students' presentations this evening, because I think we're going to touch a little bit on something that you've all discussed um, at some point this evening. So it's a perfect match. Um, we're going to end with recommended resources. So websites, books that you can do further research yourself. Um, so let's get started with the first step, define your goals. It's important that you consider what it actually means to be sustainable and decide how this can work for your own brand. There are many factors that determine what sustainability means in a fashion company. So you really need to focus on the areas that you can work with. Two of the most important areas are ethical production and fabric selection. However you choose to tackle sustainability within your fashion brand, it's important to have honesty and integrity throughout. Let's take a look at the sustainable fashion, uh, not fashion, sustainable development goals that have been set out by the UN in 2015, the 17 sustainability goals, which emphasize a holistic approach to achieving sustainable development for all. So if we look at a few of these, they cover poverty, hunger, health and well-being, decent work and economic growth, life below water, climate action, clean water and sanitation, reduced inequalities, gender equality, etc, etc. Now, it's hard to uh, complete all of these sustainability goals. So what brands do, and I've put a few examples up on the screen now, um, brands are now focusing on certain goals that they know that they can achieve within their production chain and their design process. So we've got some examples with uh, Cornelia Webb. And as Laura mentioned, feel free at any point to make uh, screenshots of these pages so you can, again, go and do further research. Um, all these goals are outlined on these brands' websites uh, on their sustainability page. So Cornelia Webb is a uh, jewellery brand. They recycle sterling silver jewellery, so they have a circularity aspects to their design process and they focus on gender equality, responsible consumption and production and life below water. Raka is a fully sustainable company and they've only got one sustainable goal that they focus on, which is responsible consumption and production. Baum and Furtgarden, a Danish mid-level fashion company, have four goals that they've outlined that they're going to work, work towards. Clean water and sanitation, reduced inequalities, responsible consumption and production, and life on land. Gani, a Norwegian a fashion company, they've outlined three goals that they're working towards, gender equality, responsible consumption and production, and climate action. So you can see brands 
kind of pick and choose from the sustainable goals that the UN have set out that they know that they can focus on within their um, within their fashion supply chain. So, as Adele mentioned, it's very important to have clear goals in mind. It's almost important to be 100% sustainable in every way. And we're finding a lot of lack of trust amongst consumers. A lot of consumers are saying that there's a lot of greenwashing within the industry and brands are making big promises that it's very hard to keep. So it's really important with your goals that you stick to them and be quite honest and transparent about your supply chain. Otherwise, there's a very good chance you'll get caught out. We're seeing as well in current generations that the need for sustainability is increasing. You go back one slide, Adele. So we can see on this exhibit here on the right hand side, exhibit seven, that younger generations are increasingly stating that they're willing to pay more for sustainable goods. This is something that's really changed in our current generation, because in past generations, people liked the idea of sustainability, but when it came to paying for sustainability, they didn't want to pay more. Here we have four different generations. The first one, boomers, only 12% were willing to pay more for sustainable products. Gen X, only 17% were willing to pay more. Millennials, we see a big increase with 26%. And finally, we have 31%. So this is quite a significant jump. Because of this, we're seeing more and more brands investing. This is a macro trend that will be around for the foreseeable future. And definitely with the Paris agreements and other things that are happening, it's a wise business choice for your brand. As we mentioned earlier, there is a lot of greenwashing in the industry. So we have a lot of companies that are really uh, making promises and commitments. And the difficulty with making the promises and commitments that you can't keep is that consumers have more resources than ever before. If you look at that, this slide here, you will see that this is a reference for the transparency index. And what the transparency index is, is it's created by an external body and they will take a range of brands, brands that we interact with every day. Some are luxury labels and some are mass market brands. And what they will do is they will look into what information these companies provide and they will score them. If we look here, we have a range of zero to 10% all the way up to 100%. Now, with this slide, I actually cut out the 80 to 100% because no brands were reaching that in regards to traceability. Even excellent brands like Patagonia that really invest a lot of money into traceability, it's still hard to achieve. On this, we can see that we have our well-known brands. Let's start with the positives. Let's look at the ones that are doing well. So we have Patagonia, of course, which is well renowned. It's sitting on 78%. We also have Esprit, which is quite high up there. We have North Face, we have Nike, we have Timberland. So these are the brands that are in the higher range or that are scoring high in traceability within their supply chain. If we look then at the other side of the scale, so our zero to 10%, we have a lot of our luxury labels that we all aspire to purchase from. So we have, for example, Marc Jacobs, Louis Vuitton, we have Gucci, we have Dior, we have Coach, and we have Celine. And these are all sitting on 1%, meaning that these brands are not providing evidence of traceability within their supply chain, it could be that maybe they're not 100% aware of what's happening in their supply chain or they don't want to share it with consumers. For consumers, it's very easy to find this online and that can be a torn off or a warning sign for brands. So definitely making sure that you conduct your business with honesty and integrity is vital because there's a lot of resources out there that can catch you out. Thanks.
So what we're going to look at today is four areas. We're going to look at design first of all, then we'll look at fabrics, colorization, and finally we'll look at production. To get us started with design, we can see that 80% of a product's environmental impact is really locked in at the design stage. So a designer has a huge amount of work to do to ensure that their product is durable, that will last for the future, and that's made with sustainably produced materials and designed in the right way to last. There is many different approaches that you can take with regards to design. You can look at zero waste. You can look at choosing sustainable fabric choices. You can look at upcycling and you can look at reconstruction. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a variety of brands. Some of them are more conceptual and some of them are more mass market or accessible brands. So you'll see a few different market levels. Your zero waste and your um, fabric choices are great for people who maybe don't want to look at just design and want to collaborate with others in the creation of their collection. The upcycling and the reconstruction is great for people who want to be a little bit more creative with it, start cutting into garments and get stuck in. And I'll give you examples so you can see. First thing we're gonna look at is zero waste. Zero waste is a design technique that eliminates textile waste at the design stage. So the best way to describe this is by looking at these two black and white images of patterns. If we look at the patterns on the left hand side, these are traditional patterns that we see in design all of the time. If we look at the space in between these patterns, so we have our front block, we have our back block, we have our sleeve and we have our collar. And the space in between these patterns represents all the fabric that will be wasted within the process. So all that fabric will end up on the cutting room floor and will likely be sent to waste. On the right hand side, we can see an example of a zero waste pattern. This pattern utilizes the fabric in full. So very little, if anything, will end up on the cutting room floor. Next slide, perfect. So to give you an example, how you can utilize this in your brands. Well, these images are from a designer, Charlotte Bialis. And if you have a look at these looks, you wouldn't guess they're zero waste. She doesn't make a whole lot of compromises within her design. She really cleverly designs the collection and utilizes sustainability well. Next slide. So what she does is she employs the zero waste technique alongside using pre-existing or dead stock fabrics. Dead stock fabrics refer to fabrics that are left unused. Usually these are fabrics that are still left on the roll. So these are very valuable fabrics that maybe there's only a small amount of them or maybe they've been discarded by larger companies because they no longer have a use for them. So sourcing dead stock fabrics is a great way of finding sustainable materials. Again, a lot of students ask, well, how can I get the dead stock fabrics? The best way to get anything is to start networking. Speaking to maybe larger scale companies, larger scale designers and asking, do you have anything available? Do you know anybody? that has dead stock that we could avail of. Um, in this brand, she combines the zero waste with the vintage dead stock fabrics, most of them from the 1950s. She works in a small atelier and everything is produced locally. So she's based in Paris and she produces everything in Paris to reduce um, emissions. And she uses limited quantities to avoid waste. So not huge collections, only what she knows she will sell. The next option to look at with regards to design is your upcycling and your reconstruction. Upcycling and reconstruction are both kinds of recycling. 
they're very similar. The only difference is that upcycling use is made of pre-owned fabrics. These can be maybe bed linens. They can be old towels, any old fabrics that are pre-owned and no longer have a use. Whereas reconstruction refers to pre-owned garments. So cutting up and dissecting pre-owned garments. Very often these techniques can be used by designers in collaboration together. So you'll see somebody using upcycling and reconstruction in one. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at a few case studies so that you can see these two techniques being used. Of course, the first one we're going to mention is Margella. Margella, I suppose could, you could say, is the godfather of deconstruction. He is a Belgian designer. He studied in the Academy in Antwerp. And he's not officially one of the Antwerp Six, but he's definitely an honorary member. The way Margella started was he started working with materials that he had, so utilising resources he had. He actually didn't go into it with the mindset of reconstruction at all, um, but it's very well for his USP and for his current day design aesthetic. He really proved that you could make things out of nothing. And I'll show you some images here so you can have a look. These are examples of his uh, reconstruction pieces. The first one is made completely out of luggage, so out of old suitcases, and from these he has created a beautifully tailored jacket. The second one is probably a little bit more conceptual. This is all made out of plates. And the third option is the baseball gloves. So as you can see, these are all items that you wouldn't conventionally see in fabric, but using good tailoring and techniques, he's really made them work. So if we see this image on the right hand side, this is from Margiela's 2007 collection. In this, he used a pair of basketball shoes to create the waistcoat. With his designs he liked to keep the aesthetic of the original item so even though this is made from basketball shoes he didn't hide the eyelets he didn't hide the laces he keeps the integrity of the initial uh, piece we can also see though throughout his career he's kept the deconstruction but he's made it slightly more commercial so this is from one of his more recent collections as we can see, we have many jackets and coats that have been cut into, they've been placed in different ways. And the final finish is beautiful, but yet still commercial. For the Margiela label, it is important to remember that it is still a business. So there is this element of commerciality that needs to be involved. These are examples then of his very commercial pieces available on Metaporte and several other sites. Um, these pieces are not made from pre-owned garments, but they do take inspiration from the initial deconstruction ideas that we see in the catwalk. So as you can see with Margiela, he starts with the concept of upcycling reconstruction, and then he really works that on the catwalk and then translates it into commercial design. If you are somebody who is very interested in the reconstruction and the upcycling, I would definitely recommend trying out this activity. This is, um, has been featured in a magazine that Margiela actually worked on himself. And what it is, is a 16 step guide on how you can make your own item of clothing. So your own top using only white cotton socks. Um, this is the final result. So you'll see in slide 16 that the, so in slide 16, you'll see the jumper. That is the final jumper and that's being constructed by merely eight pairs of socks. Um, online, a lot of people have tried this. So if you are quite crafty, this is very fun. You can also get a lot of references from YouTube. You'll see either a lot of proud people or a lot of frustrated people trying to figure out all the little elements. 
but it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle in itself. Um, I've actually tried this out myself and the top is wearable in the end. So definitely if you have any spare cotton socks, go for it. All right, that brings us on to our next case study. And this is from a local designer, Duran Lansing. Uh, Duran Lanting works a lot with reconstruction, but in a very different way. He doesn't work with old items. Instead, he works with beautiful fashion pieces that have been made to perfection, but haven't been sold. So essentially, he instead of working with dead stock fabric, he works with dead stock clothing. And what he does is he takes images of the clothing that he has available. And you can see on the left hand side, this is an example of a collage that he creates. So he takes all of these different garments and he begins to collage them together to create the vision. On the right hand side, you can see an example of what one of his final pieces looks like. So this one, for instance, has been constructed by numerous scarves and coats. Um, when Duran Lanting was actually studying himself in university, he was highly criticised for this approach and people thought, well, it's very copy and paste. But actually, this is really an art in itself because you're taking so many different elements, you're trying to blend them together seamlessly, and also it requires a very high level of finishing. So he actually has an atelier here locally in Amsterdam. He is the main designer, he does all the collages like this. And then he has a team of six to seven uh, workers who help him create and achieve the correct finishing on the garments. And I've seen these in person, some of them, he has a lot of exhibitions in the Netherlands and the finish is excellent. Um, over the last few years, Duran Lanting has really picked up notoriety and he's done a lot of collaborations. I believe he was part of the LVMH Prize and he has also done a collaboration with Browns, which is a department store. If we go back one slide, we can see examples of his collaboration with Browns. So what he done was essentially a dream for him. They give him access to all of his dead stock, of all of their dead stock clothing. So all of the pieces that were not sold, he went in with a huge shopping trolley, chose his favourites and then began to deconstruct them and create them in new ways. And these are just two of the results that you can see currently on the Browns website. So as you can see in each piece, it's two or three pre-existing garments put together. Next slide. What I would definitely recommend for everybody is having a look. If you are interested in Duran Lansing, um, check out this um, YouTube series. It's called Be Conscious, and it'll really give you a nice insight into who he is as a designer and his personality, which plays a big role in his design, of course. And it'll give you insight into this collaboration that he created with Browns. Also, as part of this YouTube series, you'll get an insight into a lot of other sustainable designers, such as Carolina Strada. And I've watched this one myself, and it's beautiful to look at, and it's also informative. So I put the link on this slide. If anybody is interested for later reading and watching, just take a photo and check it out. All right, so regarding design, we've looked at it um, more so for the luxury market. So Duran Lanting's pieces retail are quite expensive. Also, Margiela is the same. But what for people who say, well, I want to start a sustainable label, I want it to be moderately priced and I want it to be very commercial. Well, a good reference point is, of course, Reformation. Reformation is a US women's apparel brand founded in 2009. Their motto is we make killer clothes, but we don't kill the environment. 
Reformation's main USP is that they do make commercial clothing, very wearable clothing, but what they invest in is really good pattern construction. They will do a lot of rigorous fittings with many different body types. And also, of course, they invest in sustainability. But where did the brand start? Well, Reformation started out by repurposing dresses from flea markets and vintage shops hand sewing them into new styles and reselling them in their stores. So essentially Reformation started with upcycling and reconstruction. But now we have a brand who has received a lot of investment. So they've started very small, but in the recent years, their brand has grown hugely. So in order to still remain sustainable, they've had to adapt their model. And the way that they chose to do it is instead of going to vintage markets and looking for pieces that they can upcycle, they've instead turned to dead stock fabric. So 35% of their collections are made up of dead stock fabrics that would otherwise not be used. 65% of their fabrics are sustainably sourced fabrics. These include tensile, viscose and recycled materials. So if you are starting your business, this is a good example of how your sustainability concept can grow with you as your business grows. What Reformation is really known for is, of course, their sustainable fabrics, but also their um, ref scale. As you can see here on the left hand side, we have a product from Reformation. They're selling a pair of jeans. Unlike other sites, when I go to purchase my pair of jeans, I have my sustainability impact. This is known as the REF scale, which tracks the environmental footprint of each item by adding up the pounds of carbon dioxide emitted, gallons of water, and pounds of waste that is generated in the production of this item. They then calculate these figures and they compare those to other retailers who are not producing sustainably. And that's what we have here in the sustainability impact. So as we can see, it says 19 pounds of carbon dioxide savings. So in comparison to a non-sustainable item, there is 19 pounds of carbon dioxide saved. There's 916 gallons of water saved and there's 1.2 pounds of waste savings. So this is a really nice way of showing that you have transparency in your supply chain to your consumer and also making your consumer aware of the pros of purchasing sustainably. As we said earlier, as the business grows, your approach to sustainability grows. And Reformation has definitely evolved this more holistic approach. Um, at this moment, they are quite a large scale business and they're producing a lot. So what they introduced is the neutral program. So Reformation invests in programs that replace the resources they have spent. They currently have partnerships with the Amazon conservation projects, as well as water restoration programs. There is no product in fashion that you can create that's completely carbon neutral or that doesn't have an impact on the environment. So this trade off is a really nice way of working. What they do with these partners is they make exchange emissions. So, for example, and they use a lot of tensile. Oh, sorry, one slide back. They use a lot of tensile fabric. And of course, tensile originates from the pulp of wood, which contributes to deforestation. So in place of this, what they do is they invest in the Amazon rainforest and they've currently protected a thousand acres from deforestation. They've adapted the same approach for water. So if you go onto the Reformation site, you'll see that they have a lot of beautifully colored items. And of course, they will all be dyed. And you, it's very hard. Of course, you can work with natural dye, but it still consumes water. 
what they do again is they make the exchange of emissions. So they contributed 27 million gallons of fresh water to the wetlands in California. So the main aim is what they take for the environment, they try to give back. Reformation as well, unlike a lot of other brands that we see, they have a CSO report and a sustainability report that is very clear. So when we look at a lot of, let's say, sustainability reports from luxury labels, we get a lot of paragraphs of text. And within that text, we have very general statements where they might discuss water pollution, let's say, as a general concept. Whereas when we look at reformation and more sustainable brands, we actually get facts and figures. So they clearly identify the savings that have been um, completed within the quarter, savings regarding carbon dioxide again, water and waste. And consumers are becoming more and more aware of these sustainability reports and they're really learning how you can read them accurately to get the correct information. So as a sustainable brand, you won't have anything to hide and you can really publish these accurate reports on a quarterly basis. So, of course, we could talk about case studies all day, um, but what we've done is we've just created this page of brands that we recommend that you have a look at. Each brand has very clear goals, they have very clear objectives, and they adapt sustainability in their own way. And for people who want to create their own sustainable brand, you will do the same. You can't do everything, but you work with your strengths. What would be your main goals? That brings us on to our second section, which is, of course, fabrics. So we've looked at our design and we've looked at different techniques that you can use regarding design, your zero waste, your upcycling and your reconstruction. But what happens if you would like to approach your brand from a very commercial point of view? You're not looking at it from a designer point of view. And instead, you just want to come with your uh, sustainable fabrics and produce as normal. Well, luckily, we are now in a market where sustainability is in high demand. So we see a lot of businesses, both local and international, coming up. One local business that we have is Ecological Textiles. This is a Dutch company. They're based in the south of the Netherlands. And what they specialise in is the stocking of GOT certified fabrics. So as um, some of the earlier presenters um, mentioned, GOT certified fabrics are highly renowned within the industry. So GOT is a textile production certificate that limits the use of toxic bleaches, of dyes and other chemical inputs during the production process. Overall, this is a very hard standard to achieve. It's internationally recognized as a very tough standard to maintain and to get. Um, when I um, visited the ecological textiles a few months ago, I actually went the day after the guys got their yearly GOT certification. And one of the girls there specified how difficult it was to get. So even though all of their fabrics are GOT certified, they have the certifications of where the fabric began and how it got to their um, company. Still, even within the cutting practices, they were also looked at. So this is a very stringent certificate to get. If you get it, what does it mean? Well, it means that the fabrics contain at least 95% organic fibres. It means that they are not treated with bleach, formaldehyde or any other toxic substance. It means that they've been coloured with non-toxic dyes and that they have been produced in a mill that enforces strict social and environmental standards, treating their employees and the earth with deep respect. 
So working with GOT certified fabrics within your collection can take a lot of the hard work out of it because you already know that the fabrics that you have already meet these standards. You're not only considering the environmental impacts, but also the social impacts of your fabrics and your products. As we said before, sustainability is becoming hugely popular. And um, so sustainability is not viewed in the same way as it was maybe 10 years ago. With a sustainable fashion brand, brand you don't have the same um, limitations that you might have had before. You can source all of the fabrics that you know and love, like say the likes of linen, the organic cotton, tensile, silks, wools, etc. So you still have a lot of choice. One consideration that you should keep in mind is that um, sustainable fabrics are more expensive than your traditional fabrics. So that is something that you should really factor into your costings and into your business plan. If you wanted to create a collection, let's say that is full of prints, well, then you also have another Dutch company known as House of You, and Cristiano has the sustainability kit right there. <laughs> um, what they've done is they developed this beautiful kit. It comes in that green box and it's filled with, I believe, about 15 to 20 fabrics. The fabrics are all very good quality. They're all sustainable and they're all GOT certified. And what you would do is you can order these samples directly from their website. They'll send you the box and you can submit then an image of your print, send it away with your chosen fabric and they'll deliver the print back to you. So the process is actually very easy. So let's say if you have in mind that you would like to start a business but you're not sure where to begin. You're not, you don't feel you're ready to start looking at fabrics and looking at prints. Well, what I would say, a great piece of advice is to visit fashion trade shows. One of the most popular is of course, Premier Vision. Premier Vision is a wealth of information for designers. So you will have everything from trend forecasting there to fabric mills there to printers there. And you can get a clear insight about what's on trend and what are new developments in the industry. You can request fabric samples and you can get in contact with suppliers. If you feel that you're not ready to do that, just go for the inspiration. You'll see a lot of beautiful visuals. You can attend a lot of different talks that maybe might give you ideas for the future. So Premier Vision is a must for any fashion enthusiast. Um, what I would say is it is quite exhausting. You will see a lot of people from a lot of different brands running around with notepads and pens. Um, what I would say is the first time, just go absorb it and hope for the best. Um, with sustainability, there is a huge haul as part of Premier Vision. There again, there'll be a lot of fashion talks, a lot of ideas for fabric, and a lot of ideas on how you can bring your company and your collection further with regards to sustainability. Okay, the final slide uh, that I'm going to discuss is the use of RFID labeling. And this technically is not part of the fabric section, but this is a very nice addition to add to any sustainable brand. What you have is basically an RFID code, something that we're all familiar with on a daily basis. And this RFID code will be scanned along different sections of the production cycle. So it'll be scanned when your garment is being made or when your fabric is being made in the fabric mill. It'll be scanned again when it's being produced at a factory. It'll be scanned again when the, somebody is applying trends to it. And at the end, what you will have is this RFID code that will give your consumer a list of all of the different countries where your garment has been, all of the different processes that it has experienced, and all of, well, sometimes all of the people that have been involved in its production. 
Again, for traceability within the supply chain, this is excellent for uh, consumers to see. And it really helps them understand how your garment is made and the care and attention that you put into your garment. Um, what I would say is RFID codes are not hugely popular at this minute, but within the next few months and the coming years, we will be seeing a lot more brands adopting this process. And it will nearly become the practice so that the CSO reports or the sustainability reports won't be as important because everybody will have their RFID tag. So it's something to consider. Okay, with that in mind, guys, I'm going to pass you over to Adele uh, for the next section. Thanks, Laura. I was laughing at um, you talking about people running around with notebooks at Premier Vision. I've definitely been one of them. It's <laughs> overwhelming. So be organized when you go. All right, okay, where are we on our four steps? Color. Um, Choosing colour. So Laura's already gone through step one. Uh, we've already defined our goals. We've looked at design methods where we can implement sustainability. We've looked at fabric choices. Now we're going to look at colour. Um, so we've designed our garments. We then need to um, apply a colour to it because it's very important in the design process. So as a designer, you would then design your colour card for that season. Um, decisions that you would have to make are what colour is the garment? How many colours are in the collection? Where and how will you dye your fabric? Are you having prints in the collection? And how will you produce your prints? And I'm talking about colour in terms of the textile wet processing throughout the supply chain. Uh, what is wet processes? It's um, all the wet processes, as you could imagine, um, throughout the supply chain of making uh, fabric and garments. So pre-treatment of fabric, dyeing fabric, whether it's natural fibre, synthetic fibre, Printing and under the printing umbrella, there's various different options, um, including digital printing, screen printing, block printing, roller printing, and then you've got the finishing of the fabric. Um, all of these involve different bleaches, caustic sodas, inks, dyes, alkalis, which are potentially harmful chemicals. So, what's the harm in natural in traditional dyes? Uh, many of the clothes we wear get their um, colour from synthetic dyes, which are often made by using petroleum or coal. Um, not only do they use taxing, are they taxing on the environment, such, uh, some of these, such as azo dyes, are suspected carcinogens. Um, the printing techniques are hugely dam damaging to the environment. Uh, they require huge washing preparation done to the fabric before it even gets to the printing stage, which sends chemicals into the air and the outside water environment. A typical printing process or a dyeing process includes sequestrates, alkalis, bleaching agents, stabilizers, catalysts, crease resisting agents, acid dyes, exhausting agents, soaping agents, softeners, and so on and so on. So there's uh, 20 or so more chemicals that are being added into the whole wet process of dyeing and printing fabrics. Uh, dyeing can take place uh, at multiple stages within the supply chain. You can dye yarn, fabric, um, the environmental impact of dyeing is related to the type of dye you're using, the type of material that's being dyed, the application method that you're using, and the stage that you're applying, and overall the desired effect that you're looking for. In general, dyeing requires significant amounts of water and energy due to the use of heated dye baths and rinsing baths. Many of the chemicals used in dyeing also present a huge concern to the environment. And I want to just show you some pictures on the full screen here. This is some of the impacts that um, dyeing, uh, dye, dyeing factories are having on the immediate water uh, and the environment next to the, next to the plants. The dyes go into the water that people then have to drink from, have to bathe from. It's, it's quite shocking to look at some of these pictures and the effects that the dyes then run into the water that people still need to use. I've got a few facts for you. To process one tonne of cotton, you need enough water that gives three people drinking water for their whole lifetime. So three people's drinking water for their whole lifetime is used to process one tonne of cotton. I'll just let you process that for a second. Three quarters of that water is used during the wet processes. 
Another fact, shocking fact, 56 billion litres of contaminated water is produced per year in Bangladesh, which is the equivalent of 22,500 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And this is only in Bangladesh. So what can we do to change it? What can we do to improve it? How can we implement sustainability in the colour, dyeing, printing process um, to be more sustainable in our brand? Greenpeace um, initiated the Detox My Fashion campaign. Uh, they brought attention to the pollution and the health hazards of dye and other chemicals used in the textile manufacturing process. Dyco, a company based in VASP uh, near Amsterdam, is a leader in water-free and chemical-free textile dyeing. They don't use any water to dye the, with their fabrics. They use carbon dioxide instead. Um, effectively freeing the textile dyeing companies from re reliance on water resources that might be limited and environmentally sensitive. Dye houses are also being um, forced to clean up their acts and big companies are working on ways that we can introduce natural dyes on a big scale instead of relying on synthetic dyes to make more eco-friendly options of dyeing our fabric. We go back again to the example that Laura mentioned in the fabric stage, ecological textiles. They also offer natural dyed fabrics that you can purchase from their website. A lecture we had a few weeks ago with the Knitwit Stable, um, a beautiful farm just outside of Amsterdam. They have their own Dutch Merino sheep and mohair goats. Um, they gave us a small fact when they used the yarn to create sweaters. For them to use synthetic dye, uh, to dye a kilo of their yarn costs six euro compared to 18 euro to use a natural dye, which is GOTS certified. So there is a huge difference in price when you're considering natural dye compared to synthetic traditional dyes. Natural dye is something that's becoming more and more prevalent in trend forecasting, looking to nature for inspiration and looking to nature um, to get colour and pigment from as well. Leading trend forecast website WGSN um, have given some advice on using food waste to dye our fabrics and make beautiful prints from. And I wanted to highlight one of our first year design students work, uh, Janina. She made a beautiful experiment uh, with natural dyes. Um, natural dyeing is really fun to do on a small scale in your kitchen and I highly recommend anyone to uh, try it out. You get beautiful results from it. She used onion skins, avocados, she tried shibori techniques and she ended up with some lovely colours at the end also using red cabbage. Again we look back at WGSN and pointing us constantly in the direction to look to nature for texture inspiration and for colour inspiration. A case study here of designer Flavia Arana from Brazil who implements natural dyeing in her design company. Beautiful images from her website. They use naturally sourced plants and vegetables grown in the area from the Brazil. So they rely on locally sourced um, products to dye their fabrics. They use traditional shibori techniques to make beautiful prints on their fabrics with beautiful results and colours. And here are some of the designs with the natural dye. Beautiful coral tones. Another example is uh, Hulikus, a Dutch designer who makes one-off pieces. He uses antique French linen fabric. He goes and shops in uh, French and Belgian uh, markets. He buys the French linen, he naturally dyes it with the plants that grow in his garden and he makes one-off pieces, uh, one of a kind. Uh, he gives them all a passport to trace where the garments come from, where the fabrics come from, who made it and you get sent that with each garment and you can also fill in in the passport what you do with that garment afterwards.
So we spoke a bit about colour. There's still uh, something to be done with uh, natural dyeing. Um, at the minute, a lot of small brands are focusing on natural dye. So there's still something to grow uh, that area, but it is happening and there's so much of a focus on it. I do believe that there will be a lot of changes made for that in the coming years. So we move on to production. Questions to ask yourself are how are you going to produce your clothes? When you've designed it, when you've chosen the fabric and you've chosen the colour, how are you going to get it made? Are you going to create a small atelier, um, a studio using pattern cutters and seamstresses in your local area? Are you going to use small local manufacturers to contact lo local artisans to weave fabric for you, etc.? Or are you going to use overseas, overseas production, China, India, etc.? Could you maybe contact an NGO, a non-governmental organisation to set up, set up to aid workers around the world? Uh, again, Premier Vision is a great place to gain research and contacts of manufacturers and fabric mills. The average company is aware of only about 7% of what actually takes place in their own supply chain. I find that quite um, shocking, again, to understand. 7%, it's not enough to know what happens in your own supply chain. We need to make that better. We need to make that number higher. We both go back to Laura's example in the design reformation. Their sustainability report on their website is huge. You could spend a week looking at what they let us know about their traceability, how they make their products, where they make it and who makes it. So I definitely urge you all to go and check that out. Uh, we learned from their website that they have, they're based in Los Angeles in America and they have 32 factories over there where they produce their garments. They also have one in Mexico and then they also produce in Europe and Asia. They give a platform to their workers on their website. And they also share with us statistics of where their stuff was made. So in 2019, 68% of their products were made in LA, 21% was made in China, 8% Turkey, and the rest in other countries. So they're, again, they're uh, a company that are very transparent and open uh, about telling their customer where their products are made. Here is a breakdown of the um, sustainability goals that we talked about right at the beginning that have been set out by the UN. They want to tackle over the next five years uh, these specific goals in terms of product, people, planet and progress. So for example, um, for products, they want to focus on clean water and sanitation, responsible consumption and production, life below water and life on land. So they've set, their, they've set themselves very clear goals over the next five years of what they want to focus on for each subsection. Again, this is all uh, information that's available on their website. They have an extensive report, so definitely recommend heading over to their website to learn more. Some examples I wanted to share with you. Bethany Williams, a UK designer, she was nominated for the LVMH Prize, I think at the same time that Duran Lantink was, or possibly the year before. Um, each, season, each season, she works with a different charity, NGO, um, to produce her collection. Uh, one collection she worked with a Liverpool-based shelter supporting women. Anyone who doesn't know where Liverpool is, it's in the north of England, close to where I come from. 20% um, of the profits she made for that collection went back to the shelter that she worked with. She also worked with San Patrinamo in Italy, a drug and alcohol dependency program providing skill and meaningful employment for serving and recently released women to help reintegrate them into society. Uh, something that she mentions is that she starts with the charity, so she chooses a charity or an NGO or um, a shelter each season that she wants to help uh, give work to. Then the people inspire the collection and the area informs the materials that are available. Uh, she wants to make a new system and close the loops or connect the dots with each system. And it's been widely uh, promoted that she is breaking boundaries with her community first, catwalk second fashion. So really for her, that's the first approach. 
who am I going to work with this season to help me make this collection? Who am I going to give work to and money to, to help me produce my clothing? She uses dead stock yarn from Italian mills. Uh, one collection she used the local newspaper when she worked with the Liverpool shelter. She used the local newspaper to produce unique woven textiles. She then added wax coatings to create waterproof finishes. So innovative textile approaches as well to sustainability in her work. Another brand I wanted to highlight is um, Carcel. Unfortunately, the video won't work if I play you, but please, after this, go to their website and watch the beautiful video that they highlight um, how they work with women in prisons in Peru and Thailand. They set up um, their knitting machines, sewing machines, linking machines in the prisons with these women in Peru and Thailand. Each garment that they make, you'll get a label in the back neck and it will get tell you the name of the woman that made the sweater. Super personal, lovely label and not too expensive to buy as well. So they give opportunities, fair wages and creativity to incarcerated women. Also on their website, they highlight how much they pay the women that they get to make their clothes. So here on the left, you see the national minimum wage in Peru compared to what they get paid when they're working for Carcel. And they also, on the right, break down exactly what it costs for them to make a sweater. So the materials, the labor, the operations, the packaging, etc. So they show you the true cost, their markup, and then the price for the customer. So again, showing transparency throughout their supply chain. Other NGOs and social enterprises that could be interesting for people to look into when considering production. Um, I wanted to highlight uh, a few um, charities, organisations, NGOs that I've recently come across. Turquoise Mountain um, works with um, 5,000 craftsmen and women across Afghanistan and the Middle East to revive traditional crafts creating jobs, skills, and renewed sense of identity. And label step, it's uh, more specifically aimed towards making uh, wove, uh, woven carpets, but it's a beautiful website to have a look at. It ensures all their workers around the world in Afghanistan, India, Morocco, Nepal, Turkey, etc., cetera, um, have uh, health and safety measures whilst they're working, they have fair wages, there's no child labour, there's no discrimination, there's constant audits on how the workers are being treated, there's no forced labour. So again, another um, NGO for you to have a look at. And finally, Awamaki uh, is based in uh, Peru, in Quechua, to ensure that the women that are working on traditional crafts, traditional weaving crafts, can continue working on these uh, traditions and they get paid for working on this. So again, it can be um, an interesting way to produce um, clothing, to look at NGOs that help support people around the world, um, give, them, uh, give them creativity, give them uh, fair wages, help keep their traditional crafts alive. Some final recommendations. Um, research your manufacturers. Um, there's no quick and easy way for me to suggest where you should make your products. It's all down to research and networking. Um, start by going, like Laura said, somewhere like Premier Vision. It can um, open your eyes to a lot of different manufacturers and fabric mills that are working within the industry. Um, when you find manufacturers that you find interesting, try and visit them and ask as many questions as possible. Ask them for certifications, ask them for recent audits, um, and also try and work with an agency who specialise in sustainable production. They're going to have a lot of information and a lot of contacts that they can open doors for you. Just wanted to end with some recommended resources. So again, this is a page that, feel free to make a screenshot of this page. I haven't included any links, but if you type any of these names into Google, the websites will come up. So we've got databases that show you uh, sustainable and ethical brands. 
and how ethical they really are, specifically the good on you on the left and the mock me on the top left. Fashion for Good is a company based in Amsterdam. They have a physical, it's not a store, but almost a museum that you can walk in and see the life cycle of a t-shirt um, and current sustainable brands that are highlighted on their ground floor. The Fashion Transparency Index, Laura mentioned at the beginning, highlighting uh, transparency and traceability throughout the industry. Um, fair wear and step um, I've mentioned throughout, but if you have a, if you want to do extra research, please make a screenshot of this page. You'll be able to get some good information from these websites. Recommended brands again for anyone that missed it. And I have some further reading. If any of you are interested in reading any more about sustainability in the fashion industry. And again, ending on the link that Laura mentioned at the beginning, the Margiela sock sweater. Thank you very much.